I would like to introduce and invite our next panel to the stage. Uh, to come to the stage. Oh, Indy, you're back there. <laughs> Please have a seat, gentlemen, wherever you want. Yeah. So we're going to discuss here, uh, again, the digital and the analog, and how do we bridge these uh, very two different concepts. Um, Indy Joha is uh, architect and co-founder of London-based Studio Zero Zero, uh, which is a very multidisciplinary place uh, that treats uh, design way beyond its traditional boundaries, which I think is very uh, urgently needed, and also something that we can see in the Global South a lot. Um, he was involved in uh, the development of, of OpenDesk, for example, that you can see here uh, at the Clarity. Um, and next to him, Thibaut, Pré Thibaut Prévé, um, maybe most best known for Grand Central, a uh, very analog printing device uh, where you could tweet messages and then you would have like very analog um, um, pens writing this message. And um, of course, um, Jan Bolen. Uh, again, I don't think I have to present him here in this audience, to this audience, a very renowned thinker, uh, founder of Z33. Um, please. Thank you, Emily. Thank you, Vitra Design Museum, for having us here. Um, I think it's the right moment to discuss a kind uh, of merger of the digital and the analog. Uh, you feel that uh, the design field is merging into that field. Uh, it's normal or almost logical that the introduction was done by somebody who is coming from a kind of uh, the music uh, with a background in culture and music. Uh, that's kind of logical uh, introduction. And now we merge into design and the design field. Both we have met earlier on in different occasions. Um, and if uh, I can say that DJ Spooky and the imaginary app is uh, for me a kind of representation of uh, how the technology and the digital and the analog is in playing in the cultural field um, in the for me, you are merging the analog and the digital into economics, but also relating to the design field itself. And uh, Thibault, uh, if I may say, uh, you are merging the digital and the analog also in the design field, in objects, in furniture, in uh, projects itself. Is that a I, was, I see we only have two microphones, so I give first the floor to Thibault. Is that a correct analysis of your practice? Or? Yeah, sure. I think um, for me, uh, the process that I'm developing is really about uh, taking all this sort of nerdy background um, that I used to have as a physics uh, student and then actually becoming a, a graphic designer first and repurposing it um, like getting involved into the design field and, and reusing all this uh, technical baggage that, uh, that I have and, and yeah, sort of developing a practice that uh, really involves the technology into the maybe more furniture or objects. And I think like it's probably powered by um, like the recent advance in tools that have been penetrating uh, classrooms in design schools uh, that power all this new um, yeah. practice. Yeah. Can you give a, a, a one example where the merge of analog and the digital is uh, in your design is like uh, uh, very obvious or uh, just to, for a general introduction for the public? Uh, so actually one of my uh, very last projects that I showed uh, last month here um, involves pr uh, printed circuit boards. So really the, um, what motherboards are, or electronic circuits are made out of. And then I have uh, microcontrollers on them, and the boards can warm up, and the boards are painted with uh, thermochromic ink. So that means that uh, basically through software, I can modify the, the, the actual appearance of the paint 
and change the color of the material directly through uh, variables in software. Okay. So, yeah. yeah. Um, thank you. Uh, in the um, discussion, we were discussing already uh, several times, several topics. Uh, it's a kind of both. You have a fluid uh, uh, practice. I cannot get a grip uh, on you. Like it's very difficult to define your practice itself. Uh, but how would you define your practice as uh, an architect um, or yeah. not? Um, how would I define it? I, I tr try not to worry about definition. Yeah. Um, actually, that's probably the key thing. Um, if you were to say, what is our aim? I think the aim is to explore democracy and design and the role of design and production in democracy. Um, I think that, to me, is the, the kind of key conversation and how the means of production to the means of the platforms and the environments we create, how they, cr how they enable democracy or disempower democracy. And I don't mean democracy in a kind of voter sense. I mean the democracy of organization. And that, to me, is the really interesting thing. And the profound question I suppose I'm, I'm not yet able to answer and I'm struggling with, which is, I think, more interesting, is, is how do we deal... I, what I found today about the whole talk, talks I've been listening to, and I think probably in most of our work, is that we can deal with the, we can deal with the systems worldview. And I think this kind of democratization of production, everything. But actually, the thing I've been holding back on, and I think the two divides I've seen, is there is a conversation of empathy and there's a conversation of the democratization of production. And there's a gap between the two. And unless we're able to bridge that gap of actually a new form of advanced empathy, our means of production, our systems of production are increasingly becoming decentralized and connected, but they're not able to transmit empathy. Mm -hmm. And this, I think, is one of the most interesting questions for me, because I think we're able to scale our reach, but not scale our empathy. And that is actually causing a lot of really interesting feedback cycles. And so other that things. is the last gap that has to be bridged, or yeah, or, or the next gap, yeah, I, or I the next step. The, I don't know about the last, but yeah? yeah. But empathy is really part of your practice. You really communicate with the machines. The human uh, design interaction uh, is an empathy, and even emotions. Yeah. Uh, uh, and fear uh, are around continuously. Can, can you, uh, are you agreeing with him, by the way? Um, I, I, yeah, I would say I tend to agree with him. Like, in my project, I try to involve um, a reaction, a reaction in, the, um, in the user or the public. Like, it's, I don't really produce objects that are useful, but the, the whole goal of the, the object is to create a connection with the person to to make them react upon, upon things. I don't know if that answers. Yeah, question. that is an answer, of course. But it's also a, uh, a dangerous or uh, a possible danger that uh, this, um, this false idea of democracy, that you are participating in a process and that you communicate, but you're not. Are you really communicating? Are you really participating? Are you really exchanging? Um, do you believe that? Or, uh, and now I look back to Indy. I mean, I, I would say much of empathetic design has been focused on mimicking empathy mm. and mimicking reactions. Empathy is about the human-to-human -human relationship and the relationship of the object as an, as an intermediary. And I don't know how to do that yet. So I think reactions are not empathy. Uh, me falling off the stool does not make empathy. Actually, what you guys feel when I fall off that stool creates the empathy. And the question is, how do we scale the architecture of empathy in that sense? And what I find interesting is many of our descriptors, many of the way we describe what we do, are still locked in a top-down modality. Whereas actually the relational economy that we're relying on is a completely different discourse. So I, I think we, there's something else. Like, um, I think there's something else to reach for. Okay. Um, so it's in that peer-to-peer -peer relation that it's, that it's happening. He was referring to a share that we were falling off. Sure. Uh, 
you did something like that. Maybe yeah, yeah, it's better sure. that you explain it than me. So in that context, it was a chair that had sensors in it, so you could only sit on the chair eight times, and then the chair uh, disabled itself and broke down. So I would say, like, I completely agree about this question of empathy, but here the point was just completely different because here it's about talking about the technology of DRMs uh, involved in the product design, and that was really a completely different uh, object. So yeah, I, I'm guilty of having made a chair where you fall. <laughs> no, no, no. But, I, I, I but it, doing the same thing. Yeah, exactly. I think the question is, what's the next story? Yeah. I think yeah. No, I wasn't being. I don't think we're doing any better. Trust me. Um, I think we we're still making chairs that fall, uh, metaphorically. I think the question is, what's the next story? Because if I if I listen to Professor Gupta, and I think this was the profound thing I was left wondering. Actually, more and more we're looking at systems and looking at designing systems. If you wanted to paradise that, uh, sort of not objects, but actually the systems and systems which are unbounded. And the the challenge is, how do you scale empathy? And how do you not turn it into an industrial process again? And that, to me, is about language, organization. It's about different forms of kind of challenges. Uh, hope as opposed to fear, mechanisms of control, the, the kind of conversation that was going on about corporate form. All these things come into play on this stuff, which is, I think, where, where the world is getting really exciting right now. Mm -hmm. Systems, networks. Um, could you imagine a world full of products and objects of Thibault uh, that start to uh, react and act uh, with each other and interact with, with us all? And what would happen then? I don't know if that would be a very nice place. <laughs> no. <laughs> like, I, I I'm quite interested with the Internet of Things movement and like the pervasive computing, uh, physical computing itself. But I would say that when I finished, when I graduated, I was very fascinated by it in a very um, optimistic way. In the last three years where I've been really getting, uh, building a critical discourse around this, I'm much more taking distance with it. So when you like produce this idea where everything is connected and it's nice, and that's the industry wants us to, to or push this idea. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that it's, such a nice place. Like I, uh, the panel before, uh, Joseph uh, was talking uh, about uh, this or like the Ram House that they show mm -hmm. is really much more the backdrop. Like when you push the, the curtain, but it's not so nice. So, so, so yeah, it's, uh, you want to go from time to time in airplane mode. Um, yeah, I guess we should be more in airplane mode. Yeah, I, I remember that we had a talk in Lausanne. Uh, in a restaurant, and where you say, "I can hack an airplane," I can, I can. Uh, I cannot, but some people can. can yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, you don't want to live in that kind of world. Well, yeah, I guess we just have to be more careful in our technological mm -hmm. use. Yeah. yeah, that that is an uh, kind of uh, an opposition of your approach. You have really a kind of very positive um, uh, belief in the Internet of Things, how uh, companies can deal with that information. You don't see any problem there. It's quite also very neoliberal. Um, I, that, this gets interesting. Yeah. So I, I think there are lots of problems. I try to provoke it. I know, no, good. I think it's interesting. So the challenge is to reinvent that structure. Uh, so there exist organizations, typologies like B Corps, which changed the role of directors. There's increasingly an open data movement, an open sector movement, which is about driving transparency into corporate behaviors. I think we have to talk about how do we introduce morality as an intrinsic act. Designers, you know, designers can, can act to advance the transparency of the object and the authenticity of the object or mask it. So how many times do we see a product that is masked, that looks like it's made in a natural farm when we know it's been battery produced. And designers have made an act to mask its reality, an unethical packaging. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a whole institutional question about the role of design and reinventing it for the 21st century. So I don't think this is a, an acceptance of the here and now. I think it's a fundamental question about and an invitation to in reinvent it. 
Design was invented as an industrial idea. I think it needs to be reinvented in a complex emergent world. And I don't think our institutions are doing it. I think most of our institutions are still locked into a modality of advancing consumerism. So if I, I mean, I, I made a tweet, so I'm gonna make this interesting. I made a tweet uh, earlier today, so I said, museums are merely the educators of consumers. They don't educate makers, they educate consumers. So what, is it, what would that mean if the museums were educators of makers, not the consumers? I think these are fundamental... What would be the, the main... Uh, and then we come back yeah. to Thibault. What would be the... No, no, uh, first, Indy. I want to finish it. It's yeah. super interesting. What would be the main function of a museum in the future? I, th I think the museum should be a, a home for the, the democratization of the means of production, the know-how of production. Mm -hmm. I think they should become, they should be buying up technologies and making them open source and turning them into a means for open sourcing technology. I think so, whole so they should deliver access. Yeah, they should deliver access. They should, but it's about the communities of production. And I think this is something interesting. Museums were products of industrial landscapes. I think the design industry is a product of an industrial mindset. And I think it's actually a product of a late industrial mindset, even Taylorist mindset. So if you, as an, as an architect, my code of conduct was that I had to protect the public good regardless of who paid me, mm -hmm. right? This is my legal... First, the public good. First, the public good. But which architect does that? Mm -hmm. No architect defends the public good regardless who pays them. This is equivalent of the Hippocratic Oath. We've just not reinvented it. Now, if you look at MBAs in the US, Princeton, they've gone on and started to actually reinvent the Hippocratic Oath for business. I think there's a whole challenge to reinvent the institutional infrastructure of design. Mm -hmm. And I th so it's not a neoliberal perspective of accepting the now. I think it's an invitation to reinvent that. Okay. And I think that to me is where it gets interesting. Well, Thibault. Uh, heavy duty for designers, um, creating transparency uh, as much as possible and taking the, the public good as uh, the first asset, uh, the first thing. Is this really something we can do as designers or is it... Uh well, I, I think that what I've witnessed in the last uh, eight years technologically wise, and not technologically wise, but in, in tool wise, like mm -hmm. uh, when I... It's in the tools. Yeah, so I, I it's think it's in the tools, like it's easy to target and say um, the, this industry, the cloud, like all these sort of buzzwords, yeah. but in the end, like if you know the tools, you can do as much and you control, you have the same tools and um, the power in the hands of designers today is as powerful as Maybe we have, there is less money, but actually the tools are still very powerful. So I think that even on a very small scale, a designer today can do a lot. And, and yeah, like there's a strong give, response. Give a small example to make it very concrete. Um, you, you have access to exactly the same tools to connect anything you want online and then connect it and control it from anywhere in the world for just mm -hmm. a few bucks. You can do this now in your, in your weekend for a few hours. Yeah. And, uh, Can you explain shortly, because we, we had more or less the same discussion about when we started with Hacking Household in Ljubljana, with uh, the Internet of Things and the critiques there. Can you explain a little bit the project that is presented in the uh, space uh, beside there? Yeah, so actually, the project on the other side um, is really about not objects, but uh, a system. It's much more akin to open uh, structure or wiki house. And it's really um, trying to develop a new framework where objects are actually more akin to source code and the, the, the code generates the object like parametric design, but then that you can fork them and just build some different objects like this. And the, the um, Internet of Things was just a small part of it, but um, yeah, I think like we, we are much more on this um, open side of things, like the, yeah, like um, I think we should uh, maybe have a look. It's, yeah. about creating a system and not objects. So I would like uh, to go back to Indy. Um, 
we discussed more about how, how would you now envision and how would you organize, how would this, uh, this change, how can this be implemented? How will that, uh, uh, how will that transition uh, will be, be there? Because it's quite rev revolutionary what you're saying. Um, not really. I think it's part of a, a world view that's changing. So if you look at the rise of impact capital, if you look at the rise of capital which has the idea of good or sustainable economics, environmental and social economics in the center of it, I think there's a world view which is starting to recognize interdependency. And I, I don't see it as a collision. I think sort of if you look at 15th century enlightenment which gave birth to the object, I think in the late tw in the 21st century, we recognize the interdependency. The illusion of the object is recognized as the illusion. If you look at the big crises of our age, the banking crisis, the climate change, these are all about climate change crisis, uh, the kind of nuclear, any of the nuclear uh, crisis in Japan, they're all recognizing interdependency. Mm -hmm. So I think we are moving from the notion of the object to the interdependency, mm -hmm. uh, in interdependent worldview. So I think that we no longer have to worry about having to be some avant-garde system. Actually, the world is already moving. And what's interesting is I find that is the kind of global south view has the interdependency at a mindset level, at a fun, but I'm interested in how we can scale that with technology at, at some capability to actually scale the empathy of it. Because without it, it makes us dumb again. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so for me, I think interdependency is our viewpoint, uh, not complexity. Em em Empathic interdependency. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And being able to scale that. I class us as children who have the reach to be able to touch anything, but the eyes not to be able to see where we touch mm -hmm. and what we do. So we have the capacity to reach, but not the consciousness to affect that. And that, I think, is increasingly being made transparent. Supply chains, which are globally sort of provenance, uh, Ethereum, blockchain infrastructures are driving some of these things and going to change some of these things. But I think we're at the beginning of this consciousness. So what we talk about is how do we drive consciousness at the level of systems is a real open co conversation. Good. Uh, I got a sign that we have to close. Uh, empathy, public good, transparency, interdependency, and scale are like the keywords uh, for a future um, and where analog and digital will merge anyway and is merging. One closer, closing word for the designer, Thibault, heavy duty. I said that... Uh, uh, I have to close the word. You close this panel today. The last word for the designer. That's a difficult question. Um, oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> didn't plan this. No. Um, yeah. I'm Maybe just an, something that I would have um, more learned when I was studying, but as a student, you sometimes you're not taught, but as a designer, you have a much bigger responsibility that you think you have. And as uh, Corinna said before, like as a, any design gesture you do is as much political, is as much social or economical. And that it, now I'm starting to realize this because no one told me that. And yeah, like uh, if that can make a lot of more people sensitive to that. Yeah. Okay. Nice conclusion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Indy Johar. Thank you, Thibault.